coming up this week on The Travel Show. Rajan is in Jerusalem, the world's holiest city. This is, for Christianity, the most important place in the world. Quite an incredible experience to be here. We touch down in St. Martin for a spot of jet blasting and check out a music festival aiming to entice a younger crowd to the Caribbean island. And taking the perfect snap, we head to the Lake District to capture one of the UK's most photographed landscapes. I want people to see my pictures and think, wow, you know, that's inspiring, but it's something they can see with their own eyes. Jerusalem is one of the world capitals of religious tourism, and Easter and Passover make for its busiest weeks. And a particular hotspot is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where some believe Jesus is buried. Rajan got rare access to the newly renovated tomb. They call Jerusalem the world's holiest city. It's also one of the most conflicted. Politics aside, the fact is Jerusalem has monuments that are sacred to three of the world's biggest religions. Like the Western Wall for those of the Jewish faith. For Muslims, there's the distinctive Dome of the Rock Shrine. And then deep in the heart of the old city, through the Damascus Gate, is Christendom's most important church. So tucked away on the edge of the Muslim and Christian quarters, right in the marketplace, is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Not easy to find, but it's somewhere around here. And look, tiny little sign. Holy Sepulchre. And I can hear something happening. Now, what's unusual about this church is that it's actually shared by six different Christian denominations. To be precise, Roman Catholics, Greek Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox, Syrians, Coptics and Ethiopians. This ceremony I've chanced upon is led by the Armenian church. They come from all over the world, three and a half million people a year, they reckon, to visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's a pilgrimage that evokes a response like no other. For us, it's no more, no less than the holiest place on earth. That's where Jesus died, that's where he was crucified, that's where he was risen three days afterwards. So for us, that's, I mean, for the history of humanity, it's what makes that there's a before and an after Christ. It simply changed the history of humanity. 2,000 years ago, this was an empty plot of land outside the old city walls. Now look at it. They may all agree the resurrection of Christ took place here, but the truth is that the six different denominations haven't always been ideal housemates in this church. Sometimes we didn't agree. There's have been fights inside the Old Sepulchre, that's for sure. Physical fights? Even physical fights. Now, this may be Christianity's most important church, but the guy who's got the key is Muslim, uh, Adid. Hi. This is the key to this church? This is the holy key of the holy church. How come you have it and your family have it? They gave our family to be the custodian of the Holy Sepulchre Church, and it's going from father to son. The 
church had previously been destroyed in the early part of the 11th century by the then ruling caliph, and entrusting it to a Muslim family seemed like the safest bet to ensure it against future attacks. Every morning at 4am, Adib opens the door and then has to return to lock it in the evening. He's not paid for this duty. I'm proud about this job and we are here in Jerusalem, Muslims and, and uh, Christian, we are living together, we are brothers here. Disaster has struck twice over the centuries with a fire and an earthquake causing extensive damage. And throughout, arguments became very fierce and protracted between the different denominations as to how and who was going to fix the thing. They could not reach any consensus, any agreement. So in order not to stop waiting for the restoration of the Holy Sepulchre, they decided that the attitude would remain as it is and let us start the restoration of the rest of the compound. Because of all the infighting, it took a long time for all the parties to agree on a restoration plan for the ageing church. And even after that, it's taken 60 years to renovate the shrine. We were lucky enough to be granted a truly rare privilege to go and film inside the newly renovated burial chamber called the Edicule. This is where Christians believe Jesus' body was laid to rest after he died on the cross. This is, for Christianity, the most important place in the world. Just this little square of two or three metres. Exactly the, the heart of it all. Quite an incredible experience to be here. Billions of Christians think of this place as the spiritual center of their universe. The extensive restoration work took nine months, working on the small structure above the tomb. There are two marble slabs over the sepulcher, one exactly covering the bench carved from rock that Jesus is said to be laid on. Archaeological proofs are quite consistent to say that Jesus was crucified on Calvary, which is inside this uh, building, and uh, laid into the tomb, which is inside also. Afterwards, what happened three days afterwards, uh, it belongs to the faith, as we believe that he was risen. But that the historical man, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, that he was crucified and laid in the tomb, there's many, many proofs, historical proofs that are uh, showing that. One side is the conflict, but the other side is the effort to run this place and do it together. And I think that's somehow a miracle. And that's a thought echoed by the many other millions of pilgrims who come here each year, delighted that restoration has finally been achieved and cohabitation of all the churches continues. Stay with us because still to come on the travel show. We're in the Lake District to capture one of the UK's most photographed landscapes. I like to soak up these landscapes, you know, I like to take in the atmosphere. And there's a real sense of wilderness that appeals to me in these places. And we head to the French Caribbean for a music festival aiming to help diversify St Martin. During the winter, everybody's from like up north and it's cold and they need the place to go where it's hot and like you cannot beat the island vibe. Chances are if I say festival, you'll think of Glastonbury in the UK or Coachella in the US. Now a sleepy Caribbean nation has decided to get in on the act in a bid to attract more young people. But does it have what it takes to draw a party crowd? We sent Greg McKenzie to find out.
St. Martin or St. Martin, depending on which side of the island you're on, is the smallest island in the world to be partitioned between two different nations, a French side and a Dutch side. Technically, it's two different countries and attracts more than two million visitors every year. Its airport, Princess Juliana International, is truly unique because on one side you have a public beach, on the other there's a huge mountain range. Pilots say it's one of the scariest landings in the world and it's easy to see why. So just ahead there is the A340, that's flown in from Paris. So the people on there have been on board for about eight hours and 30 minutes. Now the landing just behind us, the runway length is about 7,000 feet, but traditionally aircrafts of that size need about 8,000 feet to land safely. So there's only a tiny margin of error, if any. It's the second busiest airport in the Caribbean and as exciting as it is to watch landings from Mayho Beach, it's even more thrilling to see aircraft take off. And this is what they call jet blasting. So in a minute, we're going to all get pushed back. Wow, it's already starting. Woo! Jet blasting is when you stand as close as you can get to an airplane taking off and there are not many places in the world where you'd be able to get this close. Yeah, it became an attraction just on its own. Rolando Breeson is the director of tourism. He's tasked with making sure visitors have fun and don't injure themselves. In 2012, this jet blasting video went viral. It shows a woman being blown off her feet after losing her grip by deliberately standing in the jet blast of a plane taking off here. Fortunately, she didn't suffer any life-changing injuries, but it did prompt authorities to act by erecting more fences to increase the distance between people and jets. We had to take whatever measures we could, and fencing did create at least a bit of a little more separation that was necessary, another 10 feet of space, you know, to try and prevent people from getting just too close. The security aspect, you know, patrolling when it's a, during a busy time to make sure it's not too many people that, you know, that we can keep it under control. But the fencing is an important part. There's an international standard for it as well. How far should an aircraft be from the road? So that fence it was able to make sure that we abide by those international standards. But it's next to impossible to police this beach 24 hours a day. And it's an activity that still draws hundreds of visitors daily. Was you worried? Was you scared it might be dangerous? Yeah, we, we initially, were worried. depending how hard they rev the engines, but the first one wasn't bad, but the third one, yeah. that was crazy. Crazy, was crazy, crazy, crazy. And despite jet blasting being seen as a young but risky sport, the island is trying to appeal to a younger crowd, because the majority of those coming here are in their 50s and 60s. St. Martin is traditionally known as a musical island, so you'll find all sorts here from reggae music to samba to calypso. But a new music festival is aiming to bring something uniquely different to the island. Now in its second year, the SXM Festival, aptly named after the country's airport code, is hoping to bring a new kind of visitor. Millennials for a five-day electronic music extravaganza with more than a hundred top-name DJs. A lot of the basic roots of what is modern dance music culture uh, started in the Caribbean. It started with sound system culture in Jamaica and all of these other places. Uh, you know, the guys who bring the massive systems out, they would experiment with sound. They start experimenting with dubs and it's, this is where remixes came from. So there's a long uh, history and tradition to kind of electronic music and experimentation in the Caribbean. But some locals didn't want an electronic music festival on their shores. They wanted this little known island to be their best kept secret and remain exclusive. Not everyone was happy, of course, but I think it's because of the style of music. You know, that type of music in general scares people because 
people are look different, they dress different. So last year, that's how it kind of felt. But I, I think everyone, all the businesses realized, you know, the importance of having such a such a, an event. The festival takes place every March and attracts about 4,000 people. It's the brainchild of Julian Prince, a lifelong DJ and music promoter from Canada, who wanted to create something unique away from the club scene in places like Ibiza. Ibiza is like the motherland, it's everything, you know, they, they build this culture. So it's not like we're trying to like compete or... It's just honestly I thought that for the longest time ever, um, nothing was really happening in North America. And I just felt like we should have something like that during the winter. Everybody's from like up north and it's cold and they need the place to go where it's hot and like you cannot beat the island vibe. Your sunshine. Sunshine. And despite this event still in its infancy, the future looks bright as organisers are already planning next year's event. And as other festivals around the globe begin to tire or become too commercial, with the Caribbean as its backdrop, music is only part of the reason why SXM has the advantage. Greg McKenzie there reporting from a very warm looking St. Martin. Now to end this week's show, let's head to the north of England and the Lake District. Its landscapes have inspired a thousand artists and painters over the centuries. But now we've met a photographer who captures its rugged beauty with a camera. And sometimes he'll go to extraordinary lengths just to get the right shot. My name's Terry Abraham. I'm a self-taught, independent filmmaker. I've always had an interest in film and video. I always wanted to be hands-on, outdoors, doing something like that. I love all the British countryside. Now, I think Britain's fantastic in the, the variety, the terrain, the geology, the aesthetic appeal of the landscapes that we have in such, you know, this small group of islands. I don't think there's any, anywhere else in the UK like the Lake District. You know, every mountain or fell, as they're known around here, is, it has its own character. Um, it looks different. They're all individual. And that's the same for the valleys as well, you know, with all the lakes, you know, the stone walls, the beautiful picturesque postcard cottages and all that kind of thing. And I can see why for centuries, poets, artists, writers have you know been drawn here inspired by this landscape and and i'm no different i'm a self-taught filmmaker and i'm born of the digital age if you like you know with the likes of youtube you know how it's democratized filmmaking being able to edit videos on a laptop or a computer and the technology is developed with smaller professional cameras has enabled me to go out there and chase a dream of producing documentaries showcasing these landscapes. I tend to wild camp, which is basically pitching up a tent on the top of a mountain, totally self-reliant, you have your food, you seek your water, because that enables me to be there, ready and prepared and nice and fresh at those special moments. I like to soak up these landscapes, you know, I like to take in the atmosphere. And there's a real sense of wilderness that appeals to me in these places. I'd often tweet what I'd just taken, you know, the scenes I've been capturing on camera, because I might be filming, but at the same time I'll have a stills camera with me, and I'll take a picture and I'll share that on the social media. I do appreciate that people like to follow the journey that I'm on, whilst working on the documentaries, you know, share the sights that I see. 
Yeah, that was a good shot, that. I get a bit embarrassed and blush at times with some of the praise that I get for my work. I mean, one of the documents has been described as a worthy hymn to nature. Though it's nice getting the audience response, you know, being so positive and overwhelming in that you know, respect, it's about capturing a sort of a portrait, a time capsule of these areas that mean so much to me. I don't think there's anything special about the way I go about capturing the shots that I do, you know. Any photographer worth their salt will tell you that the best times of day for capturing a landscape of the best is arguably, well, it's more often than not at least, dawn or dusk. I want people to see my pictures and think, wow, you know, that's inspiring, but it's something they can see with their own eyes. I certainly wouldn't go back to the desk job or working in a pub and stuff like that that I used to do before. Look at it, you know, it's fantastic. And I get to enjoy this all the time. It really is about being in the right place at the right time. And there is a large element of luck as well. Terry Abraham and his beautiful photos of the Lake District there. Well, that's it for this week. Join us next week if you can, when we're in Colombia to visit the hometown of one of its most infamous residents, Pablo Escobar. If you look in here, there's a plaque on the wall with little white crosses, and that's a memorial to, I think, the amount of people they think were killed here when Pablo was here. But is it right to build an industry around a former drug lord? Don't keep those memories anymore. Please respect us. That's next week. But in the meantime, you can catch up with us on social media and online. All the details are on the screen now. But for now, from me, Crystal Lowood, and the rest of the Travel Show team, it's goodbye. Mm -hmm.